Good afternoon. It's Friday the 6th of January 2023, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Mac Robinson. Joining me in the studio today, Patrick Henningsen, as usual for Friday. Welcome to the programme, Patrick. Thank you, Mike. Good to be with you. And we've also got uh, Vanessa Bailey joining us as well. We're going to get uh, kicked off here with the latest uh, ONS statistics on mortality, which came out yesterday. Uh, and as we can see, a massive spike uh, in the week running up to Christmas. Uh, in deaths. Uh, Patrick, uh, just shy of 15,000 deaths in one week. Uh, and uh, well, it's uh, the situation with excess mortality doesn't get any better and still no answers from the government about it. In the meantime, we've got headlines like this in Plymouth Live a couple of days ago. Mum of four had heart attack and died after waiting 11 hours for an ambulance. Uh, now, doctors are now advising people just to take a taxi if they need to get to a &E quickly because the ambulance service is so crap. But here's the bit. Why, what is the government's uh, answer for this? They're not really saying anything uh, publicly in the media, at least. Uh, but uh, Carl Hennigan uh, in the Trustee Evidence uh, Substack uh, talking about the latest technical report uh, on the COVID-19 pandemic in the UK, and he quotes them. Uh, as saying this, there is little doubt that delays in presentation, reductions in secondary prevention such as statins and antihypertensives uh, and postponement of elective and semi-elective care and screening will have led to later and more severe pre presentation of non-COVID illnesses both during and after the first three waves. The combined effect of this will likely lead to a prolonged period of non-COVID excess mortality and morbidity after the worst period of the pandemic is over. Uh, Hennigan goes on to write, uh, there's, there can be little doubt that blocking access to, say, cancer screening and treatment will have disastrous consequences, one of the many legacies of lockdowns. But how did Professor Witte and his team conclude that excess cardiovascular mortality was due to lack of statins or antihypertensives? Uh, and he uh, shows the graph, a, a graph from uh, the NHS showing the number of prescriptions, or at least based on NHS data, showing the number of prescriptions for statins and antihypertensives. And as you can see, Patrick, since uh, uh, 2019 or 2018 there, uh, <clears throat> pretty much static. There's no fall in the number of prescriptions being issued. So clearly the hypertension, sorry, the <clears throat> anti-hypertension thing is complete nonsense. Uh, Hennigan then goes on to say, well, excuse me. While the data from the office for <clears throat> health improvement, sorry, can you read that? Yes, yeah, well, <coughs> I'll pick that up. While the data from the office <coughs> of uh, health Improvement and Disparities Report in Excess of Cardiovascular Disease Mortality, the, quote, independent report produced by the UK government does not attempt to understand what is causing the excess mortality <coughs> from CVD. I believe that, what does that mean, CVD? <coughs> COVID, I guess. Um, <laughs> the, the important point on this, one of the important points is what's the best-selling drug, pharmaceutical drug of the last 50 years? The one drug that has saved the bacon besides the vaccine in, during the pandemic is statins. This is the number one selling pharmaceutical product. This is the cash cow of the pharmaceutical industry. And it's, uh, a lot of people argue that's been massively overprescribed in many cases. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, mortality that can be, uh, where you can point the finger at statins themselves. There's a lot of, a lot of this if you just look through the literature. So, uh, but yeah, if you look sure, at- Sure, but to suggest that the heart attacks are being caused by a lack of statins is just ridiculous. Yeah, there's, there's so many <laughs> lifestyle issues and health issues that are gonna put somebody in the frame for a heart attack and not getting statins, I'm afraid, is not one of them, okay? Uh, so statins don't unblock your arteries and things like that, contrary to popular uh, uh, allopathic medical belief, okay? But um, yeah, so it, it, it looks like this was a good sales pitch for statins. Well, indeed. Yeah, it's a great, great earner, a great earner. But the bottom line here is excess mortality continued to fly off the charts and no serious action from the government as far as I can see on it. Yeah, and it's totally ver verboten to point the finger at the uh, experimental <coughs> uh, mRNA uh, pharmaceutical injections. That's completely verboten. <coughs> so, uh, but moving on swiftly, moving on swiftly to other matters here, another type of public health crisis 
going on uh, in Ukraine. And uh, Vladimir Putin has ordered a weekend truce in, in Ukraine. And uh, not surprisingly, the regime in Kiev is not uh, going to participate. So obviously this is the Orthodox Christmas weekend coming up January 7th. So this is what Moscow wanted here and it was flat out rejected uh, by Zelensky and Kiev. Not surprisingly, not surprisingly at the behest of Washington and London, no doubt. So no ceasefire, no chance of a ceasefire in Ukraine. So not surprising at all. So uh, what is going to happen as a result? Well, <laughs> surprise, surprise, uh, just minutes, five minutes into the Christmas truce, uh, the Ukrainian forces shelled civilian areas in Donetsk uh, in the first minute, in fact, of the Russia proclaimed Christmas ceasefire. Local authorities have confirmed. So no big surprise there. Unfortunately, this is the way things are going right now. Uh, so if you're looking at a long-term prospect for a ceasefire or for peace negotiations, uh, it's doubtful that you're going to get that. Uh, looking at this here, they can't even come to agree for a 24 hours for or weekend for a Christmas ceasefire. That's completely off the table. Of course, Washington uh, doesn't probably put a lot of uh, weight and credence into any Orthodox Christmas holidays anyway. Uh, and certainly Zelensky doesn't as well because he's um, trying to make the Orthodox Church illegal um, in, in Ukraine. So uh, recent reports of that before Christmas, pretty shocking indeed, throttling and trying to restrict people's rights of worship and so forth. So that's the democracy you have in Kiev. But here's the, here's the really interesting bit. There, there comes a statesman once in a while. Um, unfortunately, this type of statesman is not in office. You have instead a banker, a technocrat in Emmanuel Macron. This is Pierre de Gaulle. He is the grandson of the great Charles de Gaulle, uh, arguably one of the great, if not the greatest statesmen uh, in modern French uh, history. And this is what he had to say. This is very prescient indeed. The consequences of the current crisis are reflected primarily in Europe. This crisis greatly weakens the balance that my grandfather always tried to maintain. My grandfather always, always tried to maintain respectful relations with Russia. Public opinion in France is beginning to understand what the evil game of the Americans is today. By using lies primarily when communicating with allies within NATO, the United States has managed to use the Ukrainian crisis to destabilize Europe. Powerful words by the grandson of Charles de Gaulle. And he goes on. This is a very important interview he's done recently. We're just giving you, uh, serializing the, the highlights here. The Americans, as it were, cut off Europe from Russia, restored the Europeans against the Russians. Why would they do that? Because Europe, in alliance with Russia, could be a strong bloc both politically and economically, culturally and socially. In general, up to 500 million people live in the EU and the Russian Federation. Ever since the Vietnam War, Americans have always tried by force, cunning, and other dishonest means, and their allies too, I might add, uh, to make up for the loss of their economic or political uh, influence. And he goes on, Merkel recently admitted that she, that admitted that uh, uh, she never intended to apply the Minsk agreements signed back in 2015. Moreover, it was the French together with the Germans who agreed to act as guarantors of these agreements. They deliberately contributed to this war and deliberately contributed to this escalation. And he goes on, the number and depth of sanctions show that this was planned a long time ago and that that is in fact a real economic war that Americans benefit from. Americans sell their gas, natural gas to Europeans, four to seven times more than they sell in their own country. And unfortunately, almost every European is going to suffer from this in their daily lives. And he goes on, and they will tell you th uh, from the EU and the USA, the Russians are to blame for all of this. Yes, the Russians stopped supplying fuel, but only after we s stopped buying it from them, he points out, common sense. Therefore, I say, it is not the Russians who are to blame. The Russians are simply defending themselves because 11,000 sanctions have been issued against them, plus the ninth package. In my opinion, it is quite legal and natural that the Russians are defending themselves. For me, maintaining good relations with Russia is not just a legitimate desire. This is also the duty of Europe, which the Europeans are obliged to fulfill in the name of maintaining stability in the world and in Europe. Instead, we end up in a system dominated 
by a technocracy that imposes its directives on each of the member states. And he finishes here. This is, the, this is going to rattle uh, a, a few cages here. I think that no other nation since the persecution of the Jews during the Second World War has experienced such plunder as the Russian people today. Um, that's going to ruffle quite a few feathers and powerful words from what should be, in my opinion, it would be nice to see a statesman like this emerge during our generation, but at the moment I don't see it. I just see technocrats. I mean, very powerful words, but uh, uh, Vanessa, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on this, but the, the number 11,000 with respect to the number of sanctions that have been imposed, you know, every time on the column we mention the latest round of sanctions that's been imposed on Russia, and you don't really get an idea of just the scale of the sanctions. 11,000 is staggering. Uh, Vanessa, have you got any thoughts? Um, I mean, I would argue on that um, no other nation since the persecution of the Jews during the Second World War has experienced such plunder. I would, of course, uh, put in Palestine <laughs> um, even before that. <laughs> but, yeah, um, I mean, it's a good point that, you know, the, the Western cartel has been um, plundering and pillaging since the Second World War without cessation, without ceasefire, actually, regardless of, uh, you know, the, the ethnicity of the nations involved. Yes, okay, thank you. Now, Patrick, uh, sort of related issue, uh, but the situation with the Speaker of the House in the United States continues to rumble on. What, what's going on over there? Well, there's, uh, there, this is uh, unprecedented. It hasn't happened in over 100 years. So uh, let's take a look at this story here. Kevin McCarthy, this is the establishment's heir apparent for the uh, Republican Speaker of the House here. He's not got the votes. He's not got the votes. He's 20 votes short here. This is what's happening. Kevin McCarthy's make, they're trying to make concessions, but hard right Republicans, as according to the Washington Post, uh, they're called conservatives in America. Washington Post, hard right Republicans failed to win over the 20 dissenters, uh, sending him to a defeat on the third day of voting. They're into the fourth day today. Uh, the last time a speaker election took uh, more than one ballot and to this length, 1923. So it's 100 years. And uh, just a ninth vote? No, we're going to update that, Mike. 11th vote as of <coughs> this morning uh, here. And this is interesting. Here's one of the bones of contention. The Freedom Caucus and the sort of MAGA Republicans, uh, they've got issues with this. Kevin McCarthy is a big-time Ukraine supporter. And one of the things that they don't want, in, and they don't want to have a blank check for Ukraine. They want to audit all the uh, funding for Ukraine. So this leadership race could affect the speed in which uh, America and NATO will prosecute their proxy war against Russia in Ukraine. So, I mean, uh, is this in the, these photographs are from the, the House of Representatives itself. So he has gone in there with the, the, the yellow and, and blue uh, uh, handkerchief there and, and the badges on and the flag. Yep. And you've got to ask, when did it become acceptable to, to be posturing in this way in, in the legislature? Well, the wonderful thing, Mike, is it's not just us asking this question. There's a lot of Republicans, co real conservatives, asking this question. The other thing that's going to be up for negotiation, term limits. You'd be able to put a, a dinosaur like Nancy Pelosi out to pasture mm. after sort of four or six terms instead of she's serving till she's 90 or whatever. So that's on there. There's a lot of things. Who's going to get investigated? Is Hunter Biden going to get nailed? Is Joe, is Joe Biden going to be properly investigated? These are sort of things the establishment would lean on McCarthy, their guy, not to go uh, right. through with. So this is what's going on. I think this is very interesting and exciting democratic or democracy development in the United States. You have not seen this happen in our lifetime. And I think it's very positive. So here's an alternative candidate for speaker, uh, Byron Donalds uh, from Florida. He, what you kind of class him as an America first MAGA Republican. Uh, so they put him forward as an alternative. I don't know if he'll get the votes. I don't know who will get the votes. Even Matt Gates uh, nominated Donald Trump as speaker last night, which you can do. A speaker of the House doesn't need to be serving Congress, yet right. no one has done that. It's still legally allowed. So is, is it going to be Byron Donalds here, or are they going to go to a fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh day of voting? How many ballots is it going to take? They could do 100 ballots, but no business can be conducted, no funding, nothing can be improved until a speaker is elected. Okay. So no money for Zelensky. No money for Zelensky oh for, for the moment. So.
the, uh, the lunch money has halted uh, for Zelensky. Is it going to be Byron Donalds? Is it going to be somebody else? We don't know. Right. So we'll see. Watch this space. Okay, Vanessa, let's come over to you then. And, uh, well, the perhaps embarrassing situation, embarrassing for some, is are they finding it embarrassing uh, of uh, an Azov Brigade delegation in Israel? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this was... Uh, absolutely, in some ways staggering, in other ways it's confirmation of um, some of the information that I was putting out towards the end of last year, and I'll reconfirm that during this report. So I think it was just before Christmas, um, um, an Azov battalion, so a Nazi battalion um, delegation, arrived in Israel, and as this headline says, downplaying far-right ties, hero of Ukraine's Azov unit, holds Israel publicity tour. Quite incredible. Here is Israel basically whitewashing um, Nazis. So Ilya Samolienko of the Azov unit has been speaking in Israel about the fighting in Mariupol, but has also been assuring skeptics that his group no longer has neo-Nazi affiliations. Well, this reminds me um, of the Martin Smith interview with Abu Mohammed Jolani, of course, the leader of Al Qaeda in Idlib, when they kind of brushed him down, combed his beard, and put a suit on him. He's still Al Qaeda, um, and I would say the same here. The history of Israel arming uh, Azov and neo Nazis in Ukraine goes way back. In fact, uh, it is believed that even during Maidan, during the uh, Newland, Victoria Newland led a regime change in Kiev in 2014, Israel actually had armed battalions fighting alongside the, the ultra-nationalists and the neo-Nazis in Ukraine. Um, and here is an article in Electronic Intifada on the 4th of July 2018, Israel is arming neo-Nazis in Ukraine. We have to remember that until Netanyahu came in, the previous administration was claiming that it wasn't um, going to be sending arms to Ukraine. But as I will show uh, in this report, Netanyahu is going to be turning that policy on its head. Here you have rights groups uh, at around the same time demand Israel stop arming neo-Nazis in Ukraine. Um, and going on, Mike, um, so here we have back to, to the situation just before Christmas. Israel helped Ukraine whitewash it's Nazis, and this is an electronic uh, intifada report that I would recommend everybody goes to read. Another article in the Jerusalem Post, Ukraine's Azov Regiment Visits Israel. Mariupol is our Masada. Now, what is uh, the significance of that? I'll come on to that in a second. But let's look um, at another member of the delegation, Yulia Fedosyuk, who here is... Uh, on one of the many photo opportunities while they were in Israel. She also, as demonstrated in the Electronic Intifada article, she also has uh, an ultra-right, ultra-nationalist background. And I have to say, I mean, it's, it's slightly amusing that both of them were laying claim to effectively knowing Jews in Israel. But when pushed uh, on giving names, both of them uh, faltered in their story, it has to be said. And here um, is the visit to Masada, as I mentioned. And you will see here the, the Wolfsangel, um, the Azov, uh, effectively Nazi symbol, displayed on the uniform while actually uh, visiting um, Masada, and this is again taken from the EI article, the Electronic Intifada article. Um, the Association of Families of the Defenders of Azov style show that Samolienko and Fedosyuk visited Masada, where Samolienko uh, wrote the Nazi war, sorry, the Nazi link symbol on his uniform. Masada is the site of the mythical last stand by Jewish fighters against Roman forces. So, I mean, the symbolism of this is quite extraordinary, that uh, a visitor to Israel, sanctioned by uh, the Israeli authorities, is wearing a Nazi symbol while visiting um, a Jewish uh, symbolic site. And today, Israel holds swearing-in ceremonies for its new soldiers there, and they pledge that Masada shall not fall again. Um, it also has to be mentioned that the IDF welcomed 
or members of the Azov regiment um, um, to their centers to speak also. Um, and images were taken. I haven't verified them, so I didn't include them in this report of Azov fighters um, visiting the Wailing Wall wearing uh, the Jewish prayer cap with uh, the swastika uh, tattoo on the back of their neck. But as I say, I didn't verify that photo, so I'm not going to share it here. This is uh, a tweet from um, a, an anti-imperialist colleague, David McElwain, um, also a, a writer based in Australia, um, addressed to myself and Eva Bartlett, who is currently in Donbass reporting from there. Um, and he mentions rather wryly, as of give the game away, when they say Israel's fight with the indigenous Palestinians is like our fight with the indigenous Russians. Well, I don't really need to explain um, the, the implications of that comment. Um, here you have a tweet that was actually put out by the Azov Style Association showing their meeting with Israeli labor politician Nama Lazimi. Now, Nama Lazimi obviously later put pressure on them to remove the tweets, and the tweets were deleted. So this is actually uh, a screenshot of the deleted tweet. The working trip to Israel of the servicemen of the Azov Regiment Ilya Samoylenko and the deputy head of the Association of the Families of Azov-style Defenders, Yulia Fadishuk, has begun. Um, now, what is, you know, already it's pretty shocking um, that members of a Nazi organization have been welcomed with open arms by Israeli uh, politicians, authorities, military. Why is this happening now? Um, with Netanyahu's uh, re-election, what we're having now, and I recommend everybody goes to the Voltaire Network um, website and reads Thierry Messin's report on Ukraine and Russia since the beginning of the special military, oper excuse me, military operation. <clears throat> um, and this uh, article written in November 2022, Netanyahu government reconnects with revisionist Zionism. Now, what does this mean? Um, so first of all, he talks about the establishment of far-right militia under the new Netanyahu administration. Um, the agreement struck between the representative of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and that of his future National Security Minister Itamar Ben-Gavir provides uh, that the latter will head an autonomous armed force. Again, Ben Gavir is a Kahanist, meaning a disciple of Rabbi Meir Kahani, who demands the expulsion of Arab citizens from Israel. Of course, that means either uh, Muslims or Christians, and the establishment of a theocracy. Netanyahu is poised to sign two more agreements involving two other far right formations. So, effectively, ultra nationalist, um, elitist organizations, military formations. Um, there are several forms of Zionism, Maysan goes on, and I have spoken about this uh, revisionist Zionism. Netanyahu was a revisionist Zionist and a follower of Vladimir or Vladimir Yabotinsky, for whom his father, Benjian uh, Netanyahu, had served as private secretary. However, he proved to be rather moderate during his 16 years as prime minister. He was considered to have been, to have evolved. In reality, he had simply adapted to his conservative majorities. Today, when the Straussians, and I'll talk about that in a second, are in power in the United States behind Joe Biden, and when his personal friend, Mia Zelensky, leads the integral nationalist in Ukraine, Netanyahu has found at last the opportunity to make his youthful dreams come true. Yabotinsky, um, and people can easily go and read this up, both it's been written up by Maysan, of analysts, um, but Yabotinsky in the 1920s formed a collaboration with Simon Petlura, the president of, um, who had led a mass program against Alaski to form um, Jewish militia, Jewish security forces on the basis that if uh, Ukraine were to come under attack by Russia, then the two would join forces to fight the greater um, communist uh, threat. 
Um, now, I mentioned there the Straussians. Again, another article by Maysan, Russia declares war on the Straussians. Russia is not waging war on the Ukrainian people, but on a small group of people within the U.S. power that has transformed Ukraine without its knowledge, the Straussians. He goes on to talk about the formation of this ultra-nationalist Jewish organization by Leo Strauss at the end of the Second World War. Um, that organization has within it people like Robert Kagan, who of course is married to Victoria Newland, um, Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Pearl, uh, Jake Sullivan, of course, who's, who's instrumental in um, orchestrating the policy um, against Russia in Ukraine. And then let's have a look if I'm, if I'm uh, exaggerating things here. So this was a recent series of tweets put out by Netanyahu in response to um, Palestinian pressure on the uh, international courts to investigate Israeli policies in the occupied territories. Um, what does he say? Jewish supremacy is state policy, says Netanyahu. So it's all slightly coming true here. He then tweets out, the Jewish people have an exclusive and unquestionable right to all areas of the land of Israel. So one assumes that includes all areas currently um, considered to be Palestinian territories. The government will promote and develop settlement in all parts of the land of Israel, in the Galilee, in the Negev, in the Golan, and of course the Golan are the illegally annexed territories um, belonging to Syria, Judea, and Samaria. So here we see Netanyahu abandoning his um, perceived moderate stance that he's had for the last 16 years, and basically fulfilling the revisionist Zionist policy that has its roots very much um, in Ukraine. So that, in my opinion, is why we're seeing the acceptance of the Nazi elements by uh, Netanyahu's administration in Israel. Be any thoughts? No, other than it's kind of ridiculous that they're comparing as of Stahl the whole, uh, to Masada because, the as legend goes, the uh, fighters in, in Masada all committed suicide mm. rather than be taken by the Romans. But the uh, Azov battalions in Azovstal were on social media begging to be rescued, uh, begging Elon Musk, begging everybody, mm. anybody that could possibly <laughs> beg to, to, to get them out into a safe third country or something like that. So it, it's kind of a ridiculous comparison. But what's interesting is there was a UN vote uh, on condemning anti-Semitism just uh, a week and a half ago, I think. And uh, Ukraine uh, did not vote for it because they were upset that Israel's not giving them enough weapons. Well, of course, they want Iron Dome, <laughs> don't they? <laughs> so, yeah, the Iron Dome. Yeah. Well, no, that's the U.S. Patriot missile system. Right. That's all the Iron Dome is. It's a configuration of yeah. U.S. Patriot batteries run out of Stuttgart, Germany. So, right. But uh, it's, it's manned, engineered, and maintained by the United States, by the Pentagon. OK, well, uh, let's come back to the UK then, still related to uh, Ukraine. Uh, now, at, in 2021, in June, uh, Dominic Raab, who was then the Foreign Secretary, uh, signed an agreement with uh, Heiko Maas, who was the German Foreign Secretary. Uh, they signed a joint declaration pledging future cooperation on trade, defence and security. It was mainly on defence and security to strengthen our work together for years to come. Well, it took uh, a couple of years, uh, but here is the wonderful Ms Baerbach, uh, who has uh, come to London today uh, for the inaugural meeting. She's uh, wearing the, green, Mike. Yes, for the inaugural meeting of this strategic dialogue that was signed back in June 2021. Um, and uh, so uh, what were they talking about? Well, of course, they were talking about Ukraine. So let's see what James Cleverly had to say, uh, the current foreign secretary. We have been providing the kind of military equipment that's been put a, been, that is able to put a de decisive punch against Russian targets at range. Yes. Uh, and uh, he went on to say, we will continue to speak with the Ukrainians about what they need for the next phase of their self-defense. Uh, and we will continue working with our international partners about ensuring we provide that. Uh, and he said that tanks may well be part of that. Where they come from, which allies provide them is something that, of course, we're working on in coordination with each other. But Zelensky absolutely uh, dying to get hold of Western tanks. Um, and so the question is, where are they going to come from? In the United States, Bradley fighting vehicles, th those have already been procured, actually, um, although they, in terms of the armor and all the rest of it, all the bells and whistles, that remains to be seen. But there are, there are Bradleys in the pipeline 
for the Ukrainian armed forces as of today. Okay, and and the potential for for British tanks as well, uh, but mainly this meeting between himself and Ms. Uh, Baerbock, who of course is absolutely rabidly uh, anti-Russian and pro-Ukraine on the in this discussion, uh, is the question of what what is going to be the future uh, security partnership between uh, the uh, UK and Germany, and really it's about Britain encouraging Germany to put their hands in their pockets and provide more. Uh, I think although. Uh, Baerbock and, and others are uh, quite pro-supporting Ukraine. There's still quite a, a number of voices in Germany that aren't quite so enthusiastic. Must keep the war going. Must Mike. keep the war going. Must keep the war going. Um, okay, if you like what the UK Column does, you would like to support us, then please head over to community.ukcolumn.org. There are options to help us out there, or you can pick something up at the UK Column shop. Uh, but please do share the, any of the material that we produce uh, on the various channels. Uh, and so on. Now, uh, a reminder that on Sunday in Oxford, uh, the, there's an event going on, Not Our Future, holding an event to distribute leaflets. Uh, and uh, that we covered this uh, before uh, Christmas, if you remember. Uh, they chose Oxford as the uh, primary or the, the initial event because of the news that Oxford was effectively imposing um, you know, 15-minute city program in the not too distant future where people will not be able to drive into the centre of Oxford from various parts of the city without, uh, or at least they'll be limited in the number of journeys that they can make and so on. Um, so where and when is this happening? The details, uh, they're meeting on Sunday at 11 a.m. They're meeting at the Seacore Park and Ride near the Botley Interchange in the west of Oxford City and heading on from there. Uh, uh, details on the uh, on this, the URL that we've got on screen at the moment. Um, just encourage everybody to go to that if possible. The fact checkers, by the way, are all over this. They said, there's no fifth, there's no climate lockdowns in Oxford. It's not happening, it's not happening. Uh, right, so what did the fact checkers focus on? They fact, the, the fact checkers focused on uh, the suggestion that uh, the gateways, if we call that in inverted commas, would be physical gateways, uh, when in fact what Oxford is doing is, imp is placing uh, uh, cameras to read number plates and so on so that if you attempt to move from one area of the city to the next uh, when you don't ha when you haven't got a, uh, the right to do so you'll get a massive fine so you know effectively it is a 15 minute city uh, effectively it is a climate lockdown of a, of a kind but uh, the, never worry this fact checkers will make sure that uh, you, they, you, everybody understands the, the truth eh? that's right yes that's right uh, and uh, just another quick uh, reminder of uh, on uh, tomorrow in fact 1 p.m. St. Giles Cathedral uh, truth be told, giving a voice to the injured and bereaved as a result of uh, the vaccination program and other uh, COVID-related uh, government policy. That's taking place in Edinburgh tomorrow. Uh, so get along to that one as well. So Patrick, uh, let's get back to uh, international events and Japan and NATO. Well, look, everyone's talking about China. China is now sort of the sort of public enemy number one uh, for the United States and Britain as well. They're making a lot of noise about China, AUKUS, these uh, defense agreements right. to push the nuclear assets there into the Pacific region. So what does this mean? Well, this is kind of a big story here. Uh, this is really kind of turning the clock uh, back or changing directions on 80 years of post-World War II uh, uh, history here for the West. Japan is unveiling an unprecedented buildup in arms, 320 billion over the next five years. So this is very, very important and people need to pay very close attention here. Uh, Prime Minister Fumio uh, Kishida's government worries that Russia has uh, set a precedent that will encourage China to attack Taiwan, uh, threatening nearby Japanese islands, disrupting supplies uh, of advanced semiconductors, etc. You can see where this is going. Yes. And putting a potential stranglehold on sea lanes that supply Middle East oil. So why is this important? Well, uh, Japan's constitution forbids military buildup in offensive military forces. So this is going against the post-World War II uh, Constitution. Interestingly, that's a constitution the United States wrote for Japan and had them ratify. So why and who is pushing Japan to rearm? And here we have the answer, strategy of tension. Japan rearms under pressure from Washington. This is an excellent article by Sarah Flounders. She's a prominent uh, anti-war activist, very much on the sort of traditional left uh, there. And let's take a look at this strategy of tension. Well, look at this. 
So, dangerous shift in policy. China is Japan's largest trading partner in both imports and exports. The previous national strategy document said that Japan was seeking a mutually beneficial strategic partnership with China. Suddenly, Japan's strategists start labeling China as the greatest strategic challenge uh, in enduring the peace and security of Japan. That's from the U.S. Institute of Peace on December 19th. Uh, Japan has expanded trade with Russian gas, oil, cars, machinery. So previously, Japan's uh, December 17, 2013 National Security Strategy document called for enhanced ties and cooperation with Russia. You got the Sakhalin natural gas projects, things like this. Now Japan considers Russia a strong security concern. Does Japan consider it that, or does the United States consider it that, and it's imposing that policy on Japan? Well, it looks very like it, isn't it? it because it's just a coincidence that Japan has done a 180 on the two countries that the West considers to be the uh, uber enemies of the day. Mm -hmm. And it goes on, it gets worse. Using North Korea threat as a cover. Interesting here, Japan has previously justified its remilitarization by claiming North Korea is a threat. However, retired Maritime Self-Defense Force uh, Admiral uh, to uh, Tomohisha Takai uh, told the media that China has been the main target for uh, which Japan has been preparing by using, quote, North Korea threat as cover. So this is something that we have suspected for a very long time. Uh, and of course, we've got this uh, furore now between North Korea and South Korea at the moment with threats of withdrawal from various agreements right at this moment, just in time for this uh, it, it initiative. Absolutely feeding into this. So that's Associated Press, December uh, 17th here. So a U.S.-Japan alliance is now defined as a cornerstone of Japan's national security policy. This is a 180 degree turn from where they were before. Mm. And so if you talk about the pivot to Asia, look at this, arming up Japan to point at China. So let's take a look at this here. Here's the important part, Mike. Defense spending will escalate to 2% of gross domestic product equal to the goal that U.S. sets for its NATO allies. Japan's economy is the world's third largest on paper. So think about AUKUS, all of the rhetoric. What have we seen? When Remember when Liz Truss was doing her uh, military uh, pr promotional tour? Right. And this is what they're talking about, is expanding NATO into the Pacific here. And what's interesting, the assassination of uh, Shinzo Abe, you remember mm -hmm. that? Yes. This past summer. And people said, oh, this was a, a lone wolf, a lone nut, or whatever. But, you know, after he was killed, uh, the Liberal Democrat Party, which is a traditional right-wing pro-U.S. party that's kind of dominated that side of Japanese politics since the 1950s, mm. the, they managed to get a, a lot of votes uh, after that. They got a little bump for some reason, and it gave them a two-thirds supermajority in the Japanese parliament, and that enables them to do something like this, okay? This is an extreme policy shift, okay? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think this looks good. It doesn't bode well. Uh, for the balance of power, and certainly it feeds into that sort of pivot to Asia. And look at the situation with Taiwan right now. Mm -hmm. um, could, could China be baited into doing something in the same way that Russia was drawn into the Donbass, where it felt like it had no choice? I don't know about a full-blown invasion of Taiwan, but certainly a naval blockade or something like this could, could, uh, could happen. And then what? Then where are we at? We're going to be in a new sort of... A new world. A new sure. world, yeah. For sure. Well, look, just uh, talking about NATO and very, very briefly, I uh, just want to mention the NATO Defence Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic. It's called DIANA. Uh, and uh, the UK's uh, Defence and Security Accelerator is going to be hosting events in February, uh, all about for the industry, all about uh, what NATO wants from the industry with respect to innovation uh, and, and the future. Um, so they recently approved NATO. This is their strategic direction for Diana. Uh, and it's they're talking about en energy resilience. They're talking about secure information sharing. So this is bulk data collection, bulk data uh, sharing amongst NATO members uh, and uh, sensing and surveillance 
uh, and so on and this type of thing. But on top of that, uh, they're also in the future going to be looking at AI. They're going to be looking at cybersecurity and these kinds of things. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that that was taking place in, in a couple of weeks' time. And that's a huge gravy train, the cybersecurity yes. AI side. But looking at the Japan, looking at this, which you've shown me here, looking at um, the Ukrainian aid, and building up uh, new NATO members in Europe. This is a bonanza mm. for U.S. defense contractors. So they're looking at that. That was a 320 billion five-year program for Japan. That's going to put some of the biggest contractors in the chips for quite a few years to come. And the whole arm and equip Ukraine is basically about backfilling with new gear in the U.S. and unloading the U.S. and NATO partners unloading all their old gear into Ukraine into a trash heap and then they'll get new stuff replaced, shiny new equipment and all the latest stuff all paid for via this so-called uh, war in Ukraine. Yes. So it's, it's a bonanza any way you cut it. And that's one of the driving forces uh, behind this. This creating a beachhead in what's left of Ukraine, will, if they have enough time, they'll be able to make the whole of Eastern Europe a beachhead for NATO. And it's gonna be stocked with US manned, stocked, managed, uh, equipped, all of it, engineers, forever. So think about the Cold War and what sort of force levels we had in Europe, in Germany, right. for instance, Britain and the US, a massive amount compared but to- But it's not going to be Germany now, it's going to be, it's now moved east, it's going to be Poland, Latvia, Lithuania, these countries that are right. going to be the, the main recipients of the, the boots on the ground. Yep, yep, Poland, Western, possibly Western Ukraine, oops. Yeah. Or, or, or a new part of Poland, perhaps. Yeah. So we'll see. Yes, indeed. Okay, well, uh, Vanessa, let's move to Syria then. And uh, there have been some developments recently. Yeah, I also just wanted to say, don't forget um, the NATO buildup in Mauritania in West Africa, which is also the opening of a new front against what is perceived as uh, Russian and Chinese expansionism in Africa. That's quite a big subject, but maybe we can talk about it in extra. Yes. Um, uh, so, yeah, recently what I wanted to do, or, or what I wanted to do was just focus on recent events in Syria um, because uh, things are sort of developing, I won't say entirely 100% positively, but they're developing in one direction or two. Um, so, first of all, uh, in the new year, uh, Syrian president receives Abdullah bin Zayed from United Arab Emirates in Damascus, the foreign minister from UAE. Um, it's worth mentioning here, of course, that the UAE, Bahrain, and Oman, which are the three uh, Arab nations that have um, recently spoken about reopening embassies in Damascus, are the three nations that are probably uh, the most developing relations also with Israel. So. I think almost everything that is perceived as a development within Syria it does have a degree of poison chalice about it. Um, but Syria is, you know, um, to a large degree still in a very vulnerable position. So there's a lot of jockeying for position. There is potential, of course, that this is soft fire power infiltration. Um, Israel and the West and the Gulf states having lost effectively the military war in Syria. This can be perceived as the next stage. However, um, with the economy in, uh, under siege and in free fall, um, you know, any development on the trade uh, and financial front is a positive for Syria. Now, the other aspect of course that is ongoing are the negotiations between um, Turkey, Russia, and Syria, and a recent meeting between the defense ministers and continuing talks between um, the heads of intelligence in Turkey, Russia, and Syria to try and resolve um, the issue in northern uh, Syria, where Turkey, of course, has been sort of rattling sabers and talking about ground invasions to counter um, the PKK, Kurdish separatist threat, um, which, of course, is uh, a proxy of the United uh, States. Erdogan um, is making a lot of noise about the fact that he and President Assad are destined to meet. Of course, we have to put this into the context of uh, we're coming up to elections in Turkey in June 2023. And as I keep saying, Erdogan knows that he is vulnerable to uh, what in Turkey is, is not really a very 
substantial opposition, but however, the refugee crisis is a major Achilles heel for Erdogan. So he needs Syria and Assad to help him resolve that issue. And so what we're seeing now at the moment are negotiations to try and um, push the Kurdish separatist forces back 30 kilometers inside Syria um, for the Turkish proxy forces, which are effectively Al-Qaeda based and, and origin, um, to withdraw them to the Turkish side of the border and for the border to be secured by the Syrian Arab army. That is the ideal solution. So that's what Syria is trying to achieve through these negotiations. Erdogan, of course, is trying to achieve his own gains um, and his re-election in June. What happens, of course, as soon as there is any positive dialogue between um, well, virtually any country, actually, and President Assad, Israel bombs uh, Syria, as they did on the 2nd of January when they bombed Damascus airport, which is predominantly a civilian airport, it's a commercial airport, um, killing two Syrian Arab army soldiers. And of course, Jerusalem Post and the majority of Western media, fed by Reuters and AP, etc., claim um, that it was a strike on Iran's Quds forces. It wasn't. Um, the the, the uh, majority of damage was to the airport itself. However, it's now uh, up and running again after two days. Um, and I would recommend that people go and watch this recent interview. It came out yesterday, I think, between Kamil Otrakshi on the left, who's um, a Syrian intellectual who's been writing uh, or researching uh, really a lot on the Syrian war since pre-2011, and Kibok al Masyan, who people probably know as being the founder of Syriana Analysis. Um, this dialogue is, is a very important one. It goes into a lot of depth about the history of the conflict uh, in Syria, the uh, Western uh, really hatred of Syria and Syria's alliances, and how through Syria's steadfast adhesion to, to, the, to the real resistance in the region, that's what led uh, to the war that began against them in 2011. And it talks about the number of players now involved both in Syria and in the entire region, and how difficult it is now um, to, to reach any possible resolution because you have Iran, you have Israel, you have Turkey, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, um, Syria itself, of course, you have all of the Western uh, cabal, EU uh, states, UK, US, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, <laughs> etc., all of them, and China, of course, for the Belt and Road Initiative. All of them are um, involved now in Syria, and so therefore they don't really come to any conclusion, but they agree with me that resolution of this crisis now is extremely difficult, and it's going to take um, really some masterful negotiations between uh, Putin, Assad, and the various other um, nations that, that are taking part um, in this conflict in one way or another. Brilliant. Okay, thank you very much for that. Now let's come back to uh, more slightly more domestic issues and the issue of uh, censorship, Patrick. And uh, will the Twitter leaks continue? Yeah, the Twitter files. This is one of the latest uh, dumps. Um, this is Matt Taibbi, uh, former Rolling Stone journalist. Here, uh, we'll just show you a few important uh, things to pay attention to. If this uh, illustration is disturbing, uh, trust me, it's uh, absolutely apt. Uh, <laughs> In regarding the material we're about to show you. So the FBI's belly button, what does that mean? Well, that was what Twitter became, became the access point for the FBI here. Matt Taibbi, in 2020, Twitter was struggling with the problem of public and private agencies bypassing them and going straight to the media with lists of suspected accounts. You see how this game works? Mm -hmm brigading the media, saying, how could you leave these people or allow these people to use your platform? Suspected what accounts? Russian disinformation, disinformation, fill in the blanks, COVID disinformation. You see how this goes. So it's government agencies of various uh, stripes putting pressure on social media companies to ban these. Otherwise, they'll go public to the press. Mm. Okay, so this is how it works. And take a look at this here. This is a, one of those emails that reveals, this is from, uh, well, regarding uh, Elvis Chan, the notorious FBI agent out of the San Francisco office, organizing industry calls, Mike, 
an industry call. What's an industry call? This is when all the heads of Google, Wikipedia, Twitter, Facebook meet with the government agencies, meet with the FBI, the DHS, or quote, other agencies, that means the CIA, uh, plus the uh, Health and Human Services in charge of COVID policy and things mm -hmm. like that. So these industry meetings, and this the Wikipedia angle is very interesting. Uh, thinking about the, uh, what's his name? Philip Cross. Philip Cross, not him, the, the entity known as Philip yes. Cross. Um, so this is interesting here. So uh, the state also flagged uh, with the Google disclosure of Chinese APT targeting campaigns. Uh, we may receive outreach from other U U.S. government agencies. So there's a whole story that's been crafted here post-2016 election about Russian interference yeah. or uh, the Internet Research Agency and so forth. Let's take a look at this. Here's another one uh, here. And so again, they're giving more detail here that you're a Roth head of content moder management or moderation or whatever the censorship czar at Twitter. Is, this is an email from the FBI from the FBI, basically telling him, yeah, we need to, we need to get direct access um, in there. We want Twitter um, to be the FBI's uh, belly button uh, into censorship, basically. And they're, you know, they did push back a little bit in some of the emails, but in, in the end they complied. In the end they complied. So this is interesting. So February 2020, as COVID broke out, the Global Engagement Center, what's that? the Global Engagement Center, a fledgling analytic type intelligence arm of the State Department, went to the media with a reported, a report called Russian Disinformation Apparatus Taking Advantage of Corona Concerns. So they melded Russia and COVID together there. This is what's going on behind the scenes to draw up blacklists for deplatforming, shadow banning, and uh, erasing tweets. So here it is, this is it. This is the, uh, the, the GEC. Uh, the Global Engagement Center, Russian disinformation taking advantage of the coronavirus concerns. So this is a completely made up scenario here. Russian linked accounts. So how do you verify that? You don't. You this just, just say it, it is one and say, that it is. So uh, the database in total, something like, you know, thousands of accounts. Uh, I saw one Excel sheet with 2,500 accounts and in total up north of 20,000. Right. 20,000 accounts, more than that, maybe in the hundreds of thousands. I'm not sure. So let's go back here. December 22nd, we highlighted this on the UK column news before Christmas. Spooks infiltrate Silicon Valley. Facebook is riddled with ex-CIA agents, including the president's briefer, who now runs a, quote, harmful content team. So many ex-FBI uh, work at Twitter, they have a Slack channel, and Google is rife with ex-CIA. So this, this happened, and people pay attention because this gets closer to home. Mint Press's Alan McLeod uh, found that former CIA agents made up some of the top ranks in almost every politically sensitive department at Meta, a.k.a. Facebook. Okay, and he goes on, and he also found that former FBI agents migrated to Twitter in droves. So you see them moving around mm -hmm. from organization to organization. Dailymail.com has been able to track down many of these former intelligence officials who are now working at top tech companies. So they've colonized the entire Silicon Valley with spooks. So, and not only that, so that's how they liaise directly with government agencies as well. So, and also this is gonna control information behind the scenes in terms of internal comms. Mm -hmm. So this is just bizarre, but it's also really shocking. And I'm gonna ask you, is this happening in the UK with the heads of social media firms and do we just not know about it yet? Uh, it, I think there's no question it's happening in the UK. The UK began the, this whole process of censorship by bringing the tech companies into 10 Downing Street for meetings with Theresa May and Amber Rudd at the time. So this whole idea of government uh, intelligence services and social media companies working together is something that began here. So there's no question in my mind that, 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 that this is exactly what's going on. Ditto with the EU. Yes. Ditto with the German government, yes. with the BND, and French intelligence. Okay, so, uh, so here's the problem. After the 26th election, Russian interference on social media, disinformation campaigns, it's fiction. They made it up. This came, we now know from the WikiLeaks and the Podesta emails and so forth, all of these various troves, this was created by the Clinton campaign to create a sort of dis uh, a distraction from the fact that she was exposed as railroading the Bernie Sanders campaign. Mm -hmm. So they had to create the Russian 
disinformation, the Russian interference. It was completely fictional. But this fiction stayed alive, and it worked its way through all the government agencies. It, it worked its way into the Integrity Initiative. All of this is based on fiction, mm -hmm. okay, right across the Atlantic. So it did affect the UK in a big way, and mm -hmm. still does. It still drives policy and funding. Let's take a look at this a little closer. Requ uh, requests arrived and were escalated from, uh, from the Treasury Department, from the NSA. Uh, virtually every state agency, the HSS, and I said this before, the FBI, Department of Homeland Security, and more. And they also received an astonishing variety of requests from officials asking for individuals they didn't, they didn't like to be banned, literally drawing up lists of individual accounts, including journalists. Here, the office for uh, the head of the House Intel Committee, Adam Schiff, the king of Russiagate, Okay, asking Twitter to ban journalist, well-known journalist, Paul Sperry. Okay, let's take a look. Here's the email here. There's Adam Schiff. So, by the way, they closed the January 6th committee finally this week. So that's been put to rest for now. But this is an email from Schiff's chief aide to Twitter, basically saying, delete Paul Sperry, get him off your platform. That is a, a ranking congressman member telling a, a, a social media company, to basically delete the account of a well-known journalist. Mm. That happened. And this isn't just the, this isn't the only example. So that's what's going on. So that's, uh, it, it, it's the, the complete merger of big tech and government. Mm. And this is corruption on a level. This is the biggest tech scandal uh, in the history of tech, in my opinion. But how come you're not reading about it in any of the major newspapers? It's completely silent. Mm. Only 10% of the media are reporting on this. So this is the biggest story. It's the biggest scandal. This is the most amount of evidence. This should, this should rock the political establishment. It should have radical rethink on what government's actually doing and why. And that's not happening. The come to Jesus moment's not happening. Mm. That should really frighten people, mm. I think, more than anything. So the censorship uh, gravy train, Mike, uh, hit New Zealand recently, uh, Jacinda Ardern, the Ardern regime here, uh, a magazine peddling, quote, a mosque attack conspiracy has been pulled from Whitcools. That's a W.H. Smith equivalent right. uh, down in New Zealand. And let's take a look at this. A conspiracy theory magazine suggesting that Christchurch terrorist attack was a false flag uh, operation appears to have been pulled from the shelves after a Twitter campaign. Okay, and there's these kind of anti- uh, war hate groups and so forth that are front running this. Mehmet uh, Sabahadeen, an editor involved in that special issue, defended it, saying it focused on conspiracies, metaphysics, and high strangeness. And he did not claim to be uh, a regular. Uh, it did not claim to be a regular news magazine. So who are they talking about? New Dawn Magazine has been banned in New Zealand as a result of this. So I know New Dawn Magazine. I write for New Dawn Magazine. So let's take a look. Not only that, Mike, uh, magazines sold in Wickles could get readers in legal trouble here. The disinformation project director, Kate Hanna, uh, says that while some of the articles would be harmless, the one about the mosque attack details uh, and where to find the banned live stream attack could get you in trouble with the police. So looking at it, this is a step beyond downloading, distributing, no, looking at it, just looking at it in print, and it tells you where you could find it in the article. Okay, this isn't a, a website with a hyperlink. It's a print article. Yep. And this has been on the shelf for decades in New Zealand, and now it has been banned. Uh, and also the, uh, th the people running these uh, brigading, like stuff, this uh, New Zealand uh, media outlet, they get state funding. They get millions of dollars to fight COVID disinformation. Mm. So what exactly are, is the problem here? I think it's bigger than that. New Dawn Magazine has been putting out a lot of material uh, challenging the vaccine narrative challenging lockdowns, challenging the COVID narrative, and it's gotten a lot of traction in Australia and New Zealand. Here's the latest issue here. We'll put that up on screen. That's the magazine that I wrote, the 2023 Lifting of the Veil. That's the New Year's edition. Okay, there's also a special edition. So they're really scared, even a print mic, uh, and they basically the reaction of the Adern regime, pull it off the shelf and burn it. So one, one mention in one article, of this uh, controversial incident that a lot of people are still debating and wondering what exactly happened. And literally the reaction because of the press getting involved, pressure from the government, 
tear, take it off the shelves and ban it forever. Yeah. So pretty, pretty incredible, but not surprising considering it's New Zealand under the current regime. Okay, let's move uh, on to data collection and, and so on. And uh, well, Palantir, I mean, we all know who Palantir is, a big tech company. They do, well, what do they do? They do bulk data collection analytics uh, for all kinds of different- uh, They predict the future. They predict the future. And they have a particular platform called Palantir Foundry. Uh, and well, Palantir Foundry is heavily used by various government departments as we're gonna come on to in a second. Um, so, the. NHS has a number of contracts with uh, Palantir, but they've just renewed one. Uh, and the, this one that we have on screen at the moment, the contract extension for data platform services. This is uh, uh, basically an interim step because they're wanting Palantir to provide uh, a data platform which will allow them to, uh, help to assist with reorganization of the health service and to deal with the massive backlog of uh, uh, treatments and so on that we're, we are all aware of. Um, so they've extended this uh, particular project. But um, here's the issue. Um, here are the notes, or the minutes rather, from the statutory board pub, uh, public agenda meeting on November uh, last year. For, and this is from, published by NHS Digital. And the, here's what it says. NHS England are, and directing NHS Digital uh, I presume that's uh, our directing NHS Digital to collect patient level identifiable data pertaining to admission, inpatient, discharge and outpatient activity from acute care settings on a daily basis. This accelerates the collection and sharing of that data in a way uh, that will enable, not quite sure what it will enable, but that's, that's their text. Uh, NHS England are also directing NHS Digital to use Foundry, a Palantir product for this collection. NHS England own the contractual relationship with Palantir. This creates a complex relationship where NHS Digital will be the data controller for the collection, but will use NHS England as a data processor and Palantir will be a sub-processor. Um, so Palantir is effectively being given access to all kinds of patient-related data on many different platforms. So not only the, the contract that's just been renewed, but other contracts as well, but it doesn't end there. Uh, here's a Telegraph article from, I think, uh, December, early December. Concerns might over Palantir's unprecedented access to UK public data. And what are they talking about? Palantir's foundry system will be able to identify and cause the cause of holdups at the border by pulling together information from HMRC, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, the Home Office and the Department for Transport. This is incredible. And, you know, we've got the British government talking about their new data strategy. And their data strategy seems to be about handing over every possible piece of data uh, on all of us that they have, whether it be health data, uh, tax records, whatever, to organizations like Palantir. I think people should be extremely concerned that's about a, this. That's a big tech company based in California. Right. So uh, some of the uh, doctors' associations are already uh, trying to deal with this, at least with respect to the NHS data. So this is uh, Doctors' Association UK, uh, sorry, uh, with with a number of others. And they have, they're attempting to bring uh, a um, uh, judicial review on the relationship with Palantir, but then we've got other uh, organizations running campaigns to try to get Palantir out of the NHS completely. Uh, so this goes on. Um, so, I mean, I don't know what your thoughts are on, on this type of bulk data collection and handing it over to organizations like this. Is all this data magic, is it going to reduce the waiting time? Uh, is it going to cut down the, uh, what's it, 12 million? on a waiting list now? At least the 13, 14, 13 million is more 14 likely. Million. I mean, how much is Palantir going to speed up that process? Is Palantir going to hire new uh, nurses and doctors, get real doctors in? Is it going to magic up some money maybe for the government? Uh, or could it be that since Palantir is developing an entire life sciences business and Britain is positioning itself to be the, the global lead on life sciences, uh, tell that us this what relationship with, with, uh, with Palantir might be very important to what's, them? What's life science? Well, you go ahead. It's big pharma. That's, right. a, that's a euphemism by big pharma. When you see the term life science, when you see government people say it, that's to camouflage big pharma. That's the term created by big pharma to make it look like it's in the business of biological science, when in fact it's not. It's in the business of petrochemicals and genetically modified organisms. That's what the life sciences is, just so people know. It's drugs. 
uh, indeed. So, but the issue of bulk data collection identity management is another aspect of this. And uh, well, here is uh, the latest. This is a consultation that the Cabinet Office has launched, and I absolutely encourage everybody to get involved in this. This is with respect to the Digital Economy Act 2017. Uh, the identity verification services objective. Um, so the cabinet office, they say, are seeking views on a proposal to support fast, safe and secure departmental data sharing uh, to enable access to online government services. But in, or in order to enable this data sharing, they've got to uh, actually identify the people that they're doing business with. So this consultation, which is going to run for eight weeks, focuses on amending existing legislation to make it easier for citizens to prove their identity by supporting data sharing uh, and identity reuse across government. It will do this by strengthening the legal basis for public sector data sharing uh, for identity verification processes. Um, so they're saying as part of, <laughs> and this is the key point, this is going to be part of what they're calling the One Login Program. Now, uh, people are having to uh, deal with the government on a digital basis on a much more regular basis. If you want to renew your car tax, you want to renew, uh, deal with HMRC, much of it is all is digital. These days, the government's pushing very hard for this. And every time you uh, interact with a government website, each of these government websites is a different login. You've got to set up a new login, a new password. You've got to prove who you are to them and so on. Uh, they want to take these multiple different logins and merge them all into one uh, login. So you'll have one login for the entire government IT estate. Um, but of course, that means that if you are become the target of an identity thief, uh, that becomes a, a, actually a very dangerous situation for one login across your entire business with government. Uh, now, whether you think that it's a good idea to have a to be interacting with government in this way, uh, in any case, but I just want to remind everybody uh, about the government's idea of uh, digital identity, uh, the idea that we have a wallet, a bit like uh, you know some kind of cryptocurrency wallet, this idea. It's the having... EU digital wallet that they're proposing as the quote vaccine passport um, just before uh, 2021. Indeed. So, and, and still is alive, that project still. It certainly is, it certainly is still alive. And, that, and your wallet will contain attributes. Uh, these are your attributes, which might include, might be your legal name, for example, might be your date of birth, your right to reside, work or study, and so on. So it is really, they're moving ahead with this very, very fast. Uh, and Palantir, I think, is going to be one of the major uh, contractors that's likely to be involved with it. Well, Palantir, this, it, looking, you're looking at the back end of a, a, a sort of vaccine passport or a digital wallet or something. But this has already been implemented in Britain, Mike, among a certain demographic of the population. The military, yes, they have a one app. It's got everything. It's got all their health information on it. It's got all their assignments. It's got everything. It's got their pay, allowances, schedule, all their vitals, everything. It's all on there. So that's already been implemented by British military and other, uh, probably the U.S. has the same thing. So they've already basically road tested this, this uh, tech. So now you're seeing a big sort of population-wide rollout but look, look at the, what the military has, and it'll give you some idea of what the government wants. It's all about convenience, though, we're told. Yes. It's not about control or surveillance. It's just, it's just to make things con more convenient for you. That's all. We don't, we're not going to spy on you or deny you access or shut this off or that. No, no, no. No. We'll never do that. Indeed. Now, uh, Rishi Sunak, uh, yesterday, the day before, gave his big speech, uh, and, uh, well, he came up with five ideas for the next year or two that he's going to pursue. He's going to halve inflation. Uh, he's going to right. get the economy growing. He's going to get debt falling. He's going to deal with the waiting list in the NHS. And he's going to deal with small boats bringing people into the country. Oof. So there you go. That's bold. Bold, bold, bold steps. Is he going to buy a real tie? Has he, has he gone to the menswear shop yet, or is it going to be Teddy Boy for the next two years? It's going to be Teddy Boy for the next two years. But look, let's do Luckily, Mike, that, that picture cuts off at just where his trousers, <laughs> the length of his trousers. Yeah, indeed. So he's getting ready for the flood. But look, on the having inflation bit, this is a ridiculous uh, thing for him to say because, of course, uh, he may... Uh, manage to get the headline of inflation, you may be able to claim uh, that the headline inflation is falling. But as we were reporting on, on uh, Wednesday's programme, uh, the issue of food inflation, uh, this is, of course, a staple for everybody. And so it, whatever the headline inflation says, uh, if food is going through the roof in terms of the costs, 
uh, it, uh, it is a major problem for everybody. We were talking about this on Wednesday, but I just wanted to make the point that in the meantime, the UK government continues to put pressure on food prices by reducing the amount of food that we produce in this country. Uh, we've got uh, new cases confirmed of, of uh, bird flu, uh, and of course they're culling the, the flocks. Uh, oh, really? Yes. Why are they culling the birds? Uh, this is, is sl it slaughtered on suspicion is policy. It is it because the bird flu is uh, deadly? So. Or no, it's so they won't suffer. Have you read the literature? Yes, on this? yes. They said it's because they don't want the birds to suffer. So the best way to keep the birds from suffering is to kill them. Yes. And kill them on mass, and that does what to the price of poultry? Puts it through the roof. It drives it up. So uh, the the whole bird flu and bird culling thing is a total scam. Look at the science behind it. People go and research. There's absolutely nothing in there. So this is total market manipulation writ large. Indeed, and here's some more market manipulation because sustainable farming is the uh, is the big thing. They've been talking about it for a number of years, uh, and the, uh, the the program that they are running for this isn't so popular with farmers because they're basically not paying enough money. Uh, but the idea is that farmers uh, really stop producing certain types of crops which are viewed as being not sustainable. Um, so, for example, uh, sugar beet, or well, but more importantly, potatoes. Uh, couldn't be uh, grown during the winter because uh, that, that would be unsustainable uh, and really doesn't fall under the, uh, if you're going to fo follow the rules of the payments that you get under the sustainable uh, regime, uh, then you can't grow things like potatoes and so on. So uh, again, pressure on oh, food production so in the country. So growing food is not sustainable. No. It's not safe. No, no, we, we need to be growing more woodland. We need to be growing more grassland. We need to be growing more f wildflower meadows and, and so on. Uh, we don't want to be producing food. We don't want to produce our own food because that would be risky, right? That would be, we don't want to grow local, right? We don't, want it, no, we should import it from Zimbabwe. That's better. That's better for the planet, right? Well, of course it is. It's more sustainable. Let's import, the, let's send the sweet corns uh, 10,000 miles by boat. That's more sustainable. People, don't you understand how the green, the green policy works? Um, but sticking with, uh, well, just, well, finishing actually with economic stuff, we're seeing now huge numbers of job losses starting to appear slowly. Uh, where do you think this is going to go? Uh, I, I'm expecting Rishi Sunak is going to announce that uh, he's going to create some jobs, uh, to good, good paying jobs, good green jobs to fill this gap. No, when Amazon starts cutting uh, jobs like this, Mike, you know that there's some serious problems coming. And it means that people, the spending's down, non-essential items are down. Mm -hmm. What does this mean across the board for uh, retail, for food, for uh, tech, everything? It means if sales go down, profits go down. If profits go down, stocks go down. So you're gonna see another stock market crash in the new year. It's, it's almost a fait accompli. Of course, it will be sustained by dust, you know, investors buying on the dip, but it's this is a huge problem. Does this mean there's going to be we're going to recover from the recession? It doesn't look like it. It doesn't look like. It. But don't worry, Mike. I, I predict Rishi Sunak's solution for inflation is going to be vouchers. It's going to he's going to just write up some vouchers and give out vouchers, inflation busting vouchers. That's my prediction. Okay. Well, of course, he's already doing that uh, with respect to energy. Uh, so no doubt he can expand that scheme to other other uh, economic areas as well. Yeah, Super. as you like. Okay. Well, we've got to leave it there for today. Um, thank you very much to Patrick and Vanessa for joining us today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes on the main live stream if you're a UK call member for uh, some extra. Uh, but in the meantime, I hope everybody has a good weekend and we'll see you on Monday as usual. Bye-bye.